Good evening and welcome to the first of what's already been called our third series. In the news this week, at Buckingham Palace, Prince Andrew holds auditions for Fergie's replacement. <laughs> <laughs> Viewers of Iranian television discover the whereabouts of Gerald Kaufman during the election campaign. And in Eastern Europe, good news for the Czech car industry as Skoda unveil their new Dormobile. <laughs> On Ian Hislop's team this week, a satirist in the traditional sense of the word, and by that I mean he's met David Frost, John Wells. And on Paul Merton's team, someone who recently appeared entirely naked in the situation comedy That's Love, but he'd like to make it absolutely clear that he was only prepared to do it for a cheap thrill and in no way for the money, Tony Slattery. <laughs> so, round one beckons and we duly oblige by showing each team one piece of news footage to identify. Ian and John, whose is this trouble and strife? This is a traditional tribal ceremony of um, divorcing someone because you think they've been trying to bump off your friends. <laughs> it's um, part of the long-running um, miscarriage of justice of putting the wrong Mandela in jail for 26 years. <laughs> yes. New song come out. Jail, Winnie Mandela. <laughs> Mm. But she, she's, she's also had a string of lovers, hasn't she, allegedly? Oh, really? Yes, Reg Varney among them, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's true. That is true. <laughs> that's not allegedly. Who was it that alleged that? Uh, Mavis Nicholson. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it's the end of the Mandela's 33-year-old marriage, uh, 27 of which uh, he spent in jail. It was obviously the strain of not being apart that finally told. <laughs> There's always the same old reasons, isn't it? A younger woman, the relationship going nowhere, the wife murdering a 14-year-old boy in order to be with the local doctor, uh, allegedly. Um, <laughs> in his uh, statement, Nelson referred to her as Comrade Numsamo Winnie Mandela. Obviously a little pet name he has for her. <laughs> he issued a joint appeal with uh, President de Klerk to cut violent crime in South Africa by at least 20%. They could do that by locking up his wife. <laughs> uh, Paul and Tony, and one or two sights for sore eyes. <laughs> well now. This is the, um, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tony Slattery again. <laughs> Who was that standing was behind the queen? <laughs> like Frank husband. Boff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is an exhibition. It's like an artist painting these pictures of the royal family in the nude, and there's been a, you know, great Chelsea, big Chelsea right? Arts Club. Chelsea Arts Club, that's yeah. right, Good. Yes. It's, uh, it's a controversial exhibition of paintings uh, by artist Don Grant, was his name, at the Chelsea Arts Club, showing various royals in the nude. There were several small studies of the Queen and Prince Philip in the altogether, plus a nude rear view of Fergie. That was actually a mural. <laughs> uh, Ian and John, spot the millionaire here. Oh, yes, this is the, um, the dog. <laughs> yes. Don't talk about Barbara like that. No, no. <laughs> it's Dog Millie, and uh, it, apparently it turns out that um, Dog Millie has written its memoirs and made much, much more money than... Mr. Bush made out of writing his, and reveals, in fact, that Dog Millie was not only in charge all through the Gulf War, <laughs> but actually appointed Dan Quayle. <laughs> oh, it all becomes clear. Oh. It's the uh, hardly surprising story that President Bush's autobiography has been massively outsold by the autobiography of his own dog, which has earned over half a million pounds. Uh, the book deals with the early morning romps in the garden, his daily squats behind the hedge, and his canine subservience to Barbara. And the dog's book... <laughs> <laughs> It feels much the same thing. Uh, Paul and Tony, a choice of viewing for you now. Um, oh. Oh, <laughs> oh that one. <laughs> Ian, no, no. I have no idea. I haven't got a clue. No um, idea. Um, the, Jonathan Ross putting on a red nose after it's, so, so it's the It's a comic relief. That, that chap was a Euro European because he had a funny name. Yeah. He looked a bit of a greaser. 
Is it anything <laughs> a little bit offensive to our European listeners? It looks a bit of a greaser. <laughs> yeah. Is it anything to do with Brussels and bureaucracy and comic relief? Ber Berlusconi, he's the man who's importing porn by satellite, isn't he? He, do, he has mm. Italian housewives taking each other's clothes off on Yes, well, he Peter Cook watches it regularly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you a point for recognising who it was. Uh, it's actually the announcement of Channel 5, due to be transmitted uh, in 1994, but on a frequency currently used by three million video recorders. Uh, the ITC, we're told, mm. have estimated the cost of retuning them all to be £200 million. Mm. Incredibly. Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. He knows it all now. It is. Oh, oh, there's yeah. always trouble for somebody, isn't there? <laughs> 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 two and a half million. Cool. What's it's Jonathan Ross got to do with two and a half million viewers? He's really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad it was you that said that. <laughs> Along with Jonathan Ross, bidders include uh, Silvio Berlusconi, uh, Italian media mogul, whose European channels are known for a cheap mixture of game shows, soap operas, and soft porn. His first project is believed to be something called The Price is Right Up Your Brookside. <laughs> Uh, all of which brings us somewhat alarmingly to the end of round one, at which point a uh, look at the scores reveals that, uh, well, Paul and Tony have a rather limp two, and Ian and John have a sturdy five. It's generally at this stage in the proceedings that we like to foist an absurd image upon each of our panellists for them to contemplate in the privacy of their own brains. Paul and Tony, here's yours. <laughs> Ian and John, there's yours. Mm. And in the ensuing 25 minutes, you're duty bound to dream up a poignant, amusing, and complaints commission friendly caption. And uh, while you're doing that, we'd like you also to take part in the rest of the show, beginning with this our uh, headlines round. One piece of tabloid nonsense each to identify and explain. Paul, yours first. Why there's a burning desire for a mm. Vindaloo. Oh, yes, I do know it. This is, um, somebody's discovered that there's something in Chile which is quite addictive, isn't Not it? Not the country. No, in the, um... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making that abundantly clear. <laughs> it's worth a point, though, don't you think? You've got a nerve calling somebody else a greaser, haven't you? <laughs> It's very, anyway, hard to, it's very hard to take an insult from someone whose haircut is done at an MOT centre. <laughs> That's a point. That's yes, a point. Uh, you were yes, halfway through an answer. Before you <laughs> yes, I was halfway through an answer. The, there is a dream ticket. ticket. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's something addictive in Chile, which is the food, not the country, which yeah. makes people hungry, which is the thing rather than the country. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've, I've lost the word. No, 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 no. I think we should get an extra point for using the word endorphins, because that's the thing. These are these pleasure hormones which are allegedly in the Vindaloo. Yes, I might deduct it, actually, <laughs> uh, endorphins. Yeah. But, uh, yes, it's, uh, it is the discovery by scientist uh, John Prescott. That's where he got to during the election, then. Uh, that uh, curry is addictive, absolutely right. Apparently, its uh, spiciness causes the body to release pleasurable pain-killing chemicals. So now, underneath the arches at Waterloo Station, you'll see loads of down and out shooting up chicken biryani. <laughs> uh, Tony, make of this what you will. And um, I want a quickie. That's um, Dan Maskell talking about Anne Hayden Jones. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, 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 the, that's, no, the, that's the divorce. They, Anne, because they're royalty, they filed for divorce, and ten minutes later they got it. With two points. It's yet another collapsing marriage, that of Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips, whose uh, divorce went through this week. Uh, with Fergie and Andrew splitting up and all the speculation about Charles and Diana, the Queen may have to wait until Edward gets hitched to find the perfect royal marriage. <laughs> Could have a long wait. <laughs> John, uh, a whimsical <laughs> pun for you. Yes, yes. Rain, rain, go away. Oh, uh, this must be the famous acid rain, Lady Althorpe. <laughs> <laughs> Princess Diana used to sing that when she was a child. What she used that? to sing, rain, rain, go away, don't come back another day. <laughs> How interesting. So much was the love between stepdaughter <laughs> And, and step step mother. mother. Mm. Didn't the man with his ear to the royal bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, Barbara yes. Carlton was there in the background as well. It doesn't quite scan. Good thing we didn't see a it. picture of her with no clothes on, Ducky. That would have been really grisly. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Extremely unpleasant thought, which we wipe from our minds. It's uh, it's the complete removal from Althorpe House of all traces of Rain Spencer, Diana's wicked stepmother. She notoriously flogged off the family treasures in order to redecorate the place in a style that was, according to friends of the family, like a tart's boudoir. 
<laughs> Obviously, to make Major Ron feel at home. <laughs> Uh, Ian, what is uh, overpriced, <coughs> over the top, and over here? Um, Elizabeth Taylor? <laughs> well, oh, true. that's absolutely unwarrantable. <laughs> <laughs> what did I is just it, say? It's true, but it's not. Could I be, is it Euro Disney? It is, oh, yes. Because it could have been fire. the Chippendales, couldn't it, or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be an American headline of Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> She's overpriced. Seven and a half thousand for that piece in Newsweek. Good All she had to do was say, John Major's a lunatic. Who appointed him? <laughs> uh, you did, you old bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, no one that's asked that. That's quite enough about uh, Mrs. Thatcher. It's, uh, it's oh. the rather under-publicised Euro Disney, Paul was absolutely right, described by uh, French commentators as a cultural Chernobyl. It seems a bit unfair on the Russian nuclear industry. <laughs> Disney's uh, sanitised image took a bash with the revelation that prostitutes had installed themselves in one of their hotels. <laughs> so new rides at Euro Disney suddenly took on a <laughs> new meaning. £50 for it goofy style and £100 for a straight Donald Duck. <laughs> all, of which, uh, all of which cartoon capers brings us to the end of round two and the scores are visibly as follows. Well, it's now Ian and John who have a flimsy seven, and Paul and Tony surge onwards with eight. I thought we'd let them. <laughs> Fusing connections round, in which the teams are brutally obliged to make sense of meaningless montages of unconnected film footage. One per team, Ian and John, unravel this slot. Is he dead? Doing Esther Ransom. <laughs> remember him? Yeah. <coughs> Balloon going up. Oh, I remember. The military, John. Yes. Oh, there's Millie again. Yeah. Oh. That's <coughs> the heir to the throne. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Very good. The governorship of Hong Kong. It is. And a list of people. I didn't know that General de Lotbiniere was put for it. Yes, de la Billiere was put up. Oh. Um, he's got a reputation for standing up to dictators, so they won't choose him. Um, <laughs> I think Jeffrey he's... Howe. Yeah. His mm -hmm. idea in the first place to hand the whole colony over. It's another good idea. Chris Patton, the man who handed over Cheltenham to the Lib Dems, so he can give <laughs> Hong Kong to the communists. <laughs> he's got them all written down. You know. I know. <laughs> yes. Tom King. Well, Sorted out Northern Ireland? <laughs> or not? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the candidates for the governorship of Hong Kong, uh, led by the favourite David Owen. The colony is being handed over to vicious Chinese torturers in five years' time. <laughs> Presumably the government's hoping Dr Owen will stay out there for six. <laughs> uh, Owen is regarded by the Hong Kong people as unsuitable, although when it comes to five years of political confusion, ending in a sad but predictable <laughs> surrender, he would seem to have more experience than most. <laughs> Uh, Paul and Tony, here's your chaotic collage. Well, it's Labour Labour leadership contest. Ken Livingston. I've got the elephant. Well, corner in the elephant vote there. Very important. <laughs> yes. Um, it, c it could also be. I, I think it, it's it's because of the the union song about um, the call for a Scottish referendum on uh, devolution for Scotland. You're going for extra points here, aren't you? Mm. You can't have any because it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it is the, the Labour leadership. leadership. Yeah, that's right. Well, that was the obvious one. But there's also yes. been a call if you'd read your newspapers angles. Which of course I have. <laughs> <laughs> which one in particular? <laughs> All of them, which oh, right. uh, say anything worth reading. But uh, you obviously stuck to tit bits. <laughs> It's the battle for uh, the Labour leadership, yes, currently being waged by uh, the man who masterminded Labour's tax policy, uh, the man who created Neil Kinnock's image, and the man who made the GLC what it is today. Absolutely nothing. And, uh, and so with uh, round three behind us, we find ourselves not unreasonably at the foot of round four, our scarcely vaunted archive round. Ian and John, a mystery voice for you to determine. What sort of ambitions do you have, parliamentary ambitions? In the long term, um, yes, like any politician, I want to be Prime Minister, of course. You want to be Prime Minister? Yes. How do you see the time scale of these personal ambitions? Fifteen years. I mean, that's an extract from Crime Watch, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the police were looking for Geoffrey Archer, it's got to be him. 
No. Interviewed leaving Victoria Station. It's an interview. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't find the envelope. <laughs> no. I think it's it might be Kil Robert Kilroy Silk. But that, of course, is only a thought that I would, and I think, would like to go any further. I mm. think it might be um, that uh, Portillo. Before we uh, actually reel off all the politicians that we know, <laughs> uh, maybe we should have a look. What sort of ambitions do you have, parliamentary ambitions? In the long term, um, yes, like any politician, I want to be Prime Minister, of course. Do you want to be Prime Minister? Yes. How do you see the timescale of these personal ambitions? Fifteen years. Oh, 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 God. That's not Robert anyway. Kilroy Silk, that's Peter Wingard. <laughs> yes, well done, Paul. It was, no, uh, it was two points to you. It was uh, Robert Kilroy Silk, pre Suntan, uh, back in 1974, revealing his ambition to be Prime Minister by 1989. Not an unreasonable ambition at the time, were it not for the fact that Labour failed to win a single election from then on. <laughs> Nowadays, in contrast to being Labour leader, he spends most weekday mornings talking to various misfits and outcasts about the mess they got themselves into. <laughs> Not much difference, really, is there? Uh, Paul and Tony, uh, what happened next for you? In central London, more photographers were waiting outside the aptly named Queen's Snack Bar for Sarah's arrival at the office. Also there were watching policemen who've only just started making regular appearances. They got a divorce. <laughs> That was ten years after that, that's what happened next. Did she suddenly go skiing? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know, no, that was a good guess, though. It was. Mm. Um, this is something to do with a photographer falling over or being knocked over or something. When a huge Texan arrives and grabs her. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I thought there was the cleaner found these um, photographs of her and Steve White on top of a sofa. On top of a cupboard. No, they were on top cupboard. Of the cupboard. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Oh, extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll, uh, I think we'll maybe have a look at, uh, yeah. at exactly what happened next. Also there were watching policemen who've only just started making regular appearances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely right. It's uh, the, remember. The, uh, the press falling over themselves to talk to a young <laughs> Sarah Ferguson mm, back in the days when the Duke of York was her local. And the civil list, <laughs> the civil list was just a twinkle in her eye. So at the end of that round, a cursory glance at the neon numbers tells us that uh, Ian and John have a brave but incompetent nine, and Paul and Tony have a magnificent fourteen. So we effortlessly mm, yes, cartwheel into our odd one out round for apparently acceptable candidates to consider which one is the Livingston. Paul, you're uh, historically first in this round, so <laughs> right. Bruce Gingell, TV enthusiast, mm -hmm. Boy George, enthusiast of a rather different kind of TV, <laughs> the Dalai Lama, <laughs> and a llama. <laughs> George, is he painted those? He must have painted those eyebrows. And like Groucho Marx used to paint on a moustache. He's <laughs> just painted on eyebrows. Um, the llama. What, how can you possibly get it so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> because um, all the others are Buddhists. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm laughing because you're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is the llama. Well, I knew that boy George was, and the Dalai Lama being sort of like Tibetan spiritual leader is kind of expected to be a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, um, I imagine the llama wasn't. Um, the llama's C of E. Yeah. <laughs> the majority of them are. Bruce Just Gingle see. was famous because Mrs. Thatcher apologised to him, which makes him the odd one out in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Bruce Gingell is a Buddhist who is actively opposed to all forms of violence, which seems strange considering he inflicted Wincy Willis on us for six <laughs> years. <laughs> Tony, get, your, uh, get your laughing gear around these. Phil Collins. <clears throat> Andrew Lloyd Webber, oh Freddie hmm. Starr, and Neil Kinnock. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Neil Kinnock and Phil Collins are slapheads. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Is it, is it the tax exile thing because Collins and Lloyd Webber and Starr are staunch Tories and they'd leave if Labour won and all that Absolutely stuff? Absolutely right. Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's what a rock and roller you are, Phil, eh? <laughs> Yes, yes, I look forward to uh, hearing his next song about the homeless. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's Neil Kinnock.
as, uh, as all the others pledged to leave the country if Labour won the election. Uh, Neil Kinnock uh, said he'd stay, which is probably why they lost. <laughs> um, Freddie Starr threatened to emigrate, uh, little knowing the boost he was giving to the Labour Party by doing so. <laughs> and, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber decided he'd leave rather than pay any more tax, uh, shortly before spending £11 million on a painting. He says he has an interest in painting, but he'll have to write another musical to pay for it. Let's hope it's just a passing interest. <laughs> <laughs> John, John uh, no show would be complete without... Robert Maxwell, oh. <laughs> Paul Keating, Australian Prime Minister, Big Mama Alice Frazier, and Lord Carnarvon. Keating was the one who looked for, searched for braille messages on the Queen's bottom during her visit <laughs> <laughs> to Australia. Oh, and I think Big Mama it. also interrupted. Did she not interfere with the Queen? <laughs> <laughs> when she was visiting downtown Washington. <laughs> yes, That's right. in a manner of speaking. Now, um, question, Maxwell? Maxwell, did he ever interfere with the Queen? <laughs> when he stole the Royal Pension Fund. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps Lord... What did you tell me he was called? Carnarvon. <laughs> Lord Carnarvon. One it, of our most famous one peers. One of our most yeah. famous peers is probably the only one who's not interfered with the Queen. Absolutely right. Is that right? Well, yes, it is. Oh, well oh. done. Two points. It's, Why uh, him, though? Why him? Uh, well, because uh, all the others have in some way manhandled the Queen, oh, whereas uh, Lord Carnarvon has, of course, never had any physical contact with the Queen at all, and the fact that he's Prince Andrew's favourite uncle is entirely without significance. <laughs> um, Robert, uh, Robert Maxwell put his arm around the Queen at a uh, Commonwealth Games, uh, probably checking her back pockets for cash. <laughs> Uh, Ian, four elfin beauties for you. I'm very interested in this Carnarvon story. <laughs> Ted Heath, Chris Patton, Bobby Robson, and Mr. Punch. <laughs> well, they're all funny except Punch. <laughs> <laughs> Next. You wouldn't be biased at all. We've said goodbye to them all recently, except... Sir Edward Heath, who has just taken the order of the exotic... Data. <laughs> <laughs> They're all losers, aren't they? Yes, that's right. They, uh, <laughs> they are losers. So who's the odd one out? The only one uh, who isn't out of a job is Sir Edward Heath. Uh, the others uh, are all out of a job by common consent of their peers, whereas Heath is staying in his job despite the common consent of his peers. <laughs> uh, which brings us spinning to the end of this round, at which point it gives me no pleasure at all to tell you <laughs> that uh, Ian and John now uh, continue their bid for defeat with 13, and uh, Paul and Tony have a gleaming 18. And so we saunter smugly into our final missing words round. Five headlines per couple, each with one or two words missing. The team's job, in an ideal world, is to guess the missing word or come up with a better alternative. In the time-honored tradition, he who comes last goes first. So, uh, Ian and John, that means you, I'm afraid, if you'd like to step up to the Oki. Mm -hmm. Gaddafi ponders offer to escort who? Agency. <laughs> <laughs> Is not right. Uh, Jason Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> is not right either. Prisoners? Suspects, Suspects is, uh, well, is the right answer. I'll give you one for prisoners. Next, uh, Prince of Wales <laughs> links population rise to what? His mother. <laughs> <laughs> not true either. Is it uh, poverty? It is poverty. Oh, oh, it's extraordinary that you should know that. Well done. Yeah, well done. Uh, I was going to say Chris Quentin, but that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> no, next, uh, yes. Tories play hunt the what? It's speaker. It is speaker. Incredible yeah. over on my Amazing. Yeah. It's the guy with the big wig in the middle. I could have told him that. <laughs> <laughs> They're never too bright that long. <laughs> the answer is speaker. Very good. That's Next. Edward Heath, isn't it? Uh, Thatcher to become what in dissolution honours? Sane. <laughs> uh, peer is in fact the answer. Oh, well, that's, well, and yeah, that's lastly, good. new yeah. DPP seeks what? Similar. <laughs> Mm, not as such. Um, um, car yeah. parking space in King's Cross area. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'll quickly tell you Lenient the answer to this. on curb crawlers. Uh, court reform. Well, you're almost on the way there. I'll give you a pint. Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. So, here we go. Paul and Tony, here are your headlines. Party members concerned over Smith's what? Ludicrous spectacles. <laughs> um, uh, they are, sanity, they health. Campaign. Um, Crisps. It's a short word. Very good. Very good. Yes, that's the one. 
Archer, isn't it? Not actually true. Ages, in fact. Ages. Ages. Answer. Next, Ages. Archer blows one and a half million on a what for his flat? Inflatable horse. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, 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 like, it's like a jacuzzi or something. Uh, no, what's this? Archer blows one and a half million pounds Rembrandt. on a something for his flat what? <laughs> it's facelift, in fact. Next, oh, uh, okay. rather dull answer. MPs' wives vote no to what party? Dildo and Swarfigo. <laughs> Plausible, isn't it? <laughs> you keep your private life out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Not correct, I'm happy to say. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> like that at all, man. What about Tupperware, Tony? Uh, what do you think? Um, is it women's? women's? Uh, late is, in fact, the answer. Late, late party. Next. <laughs> uh, major given what by Thatcher? <laughs> Good seeing two with a set of Queen Anne chair legs. <laughs> Ultimate, or, uh, a warning is in fact the answer. Yeah. And finally, RAF crew save goat from Archer. <laughs> uh, lonely Welsh farmer. <laughs> I think we're getting Hunt. further and further away from this one. Cliff is in fact the rather obvious. Now answer. that is libel. Oh. <laughs> very good. Very good. A fine entertainer indeed. <laughs> yes, let's just hope he isn't watching. All of which uh, uneducated guesswork means that this week's runts of the litter are uh, Ian and John with 15, and this week's leaders of the pack are Paul and Tony with 23. <laughs> Yeah. So, a uh, heartfelt well done to our winners and a sincere good riddance to our losers. Thank you, dear. But uh, their chance of redemption is at hand because we still have our caption competition. Ian and John, <laughs> what about yours? As um, Chris Patton is saying, and in a minute, John, I'll tell you what you can do with it. <laughs> Alternatively, Patton saying, it's a present from Mrs. Thatcher and it's ticking. <laughs> Paul and Tony, what did you think of for this? Um, Mike Tyson escape bid fails. Um, <laughs> um, Salman Rushdie undergoes plastic surgery. <laughs> uh, Mid-morning snack arrives for Roy Hattersley. <laughs> Moderate uh, candidate to bid for Labour leadership. <laughs> Edwina Curry proved right. <laughs> <laughs> On which uh, delightful note, thank you. We say uh, thank you to our guests, Ian Hislop and John Wells, Paul Merton and Tony Slattery. And I leave you with the news that the royal family has unveiled the hat which Fergie is to wear at Oscar. <laughs> or even at Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> is that the little the... known racetrack meeting? <laughs> Oscar. Well, that's quite confusing because it sounds a little bit like Ascot. <laughs> it's a thing that changed their name. I think yeah. the joke would have worked better with Ascot, actually. <laughs> it's like that yeah. motor race meeting with Bronze Hitch. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one about the Bishop of Durham now. <laughs> the Bishop of Durham personally takes part in the church's new look go ahead Easter pageant. <laughs> uh, medical history is made as a woman gives birth to a man on a bicycle. Finally, the hunt continues for the nine-year-old mystery bag snatcher. <laughs> Good night. Just so you know, tomorrow night's guests are Joan Bakewell and Donna McPhail. That's at the same time, 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Don't